the work to do. And so, now that's one thing that's not really 
touched on a lot in certain places and certain churches, but those who have grown up with literal spiritual attacks and spiritual warfare, we're going to touch on it. Okay. Uh, so, the part of the message version, I want to read that, and it says, uh, the other part says, and put them to use so you will be able to stand up to everything the devil throws at your way. This is no weekend war that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple hours. This keeps a life or death fight to the finish against the devil and lost angels. So even though you're saved, even though you're, you know, blood bought born again, the attacks are going to come. It's not a one time you're going to, oh, you're going to live a life full of roses and daisies. No, the attacks are going to come, but how you react and how you fight them is going to determine where you're going to stand. That's right. And, uh, we always tell the youth, and this is one thing that we touched on, we touch on it about three or four times a year. We always tell the youth that there's a battle for you. And uh, like we see on the cartoons, I know y'all heard me say it before, the ones that are here. And I believe that everyone here, since it's most of the youth groups, everyone's saved, right? Everyone's blood ball, everyone's in church. So if we see, you know who sees the cartoons where, you know, you have an angel right here and a demon over here. And you know, that's something you can see in the natural. But that's also very true. You know, we have a fight going on, you know, it's not just, you hear the enemy yelling, or just talking, really, and you, you like to go towards what makes you happy, what makes you feel good, what makes you, you think will fulfill you, what what you think will make you feel good. And then, you know, or you can listen to God, what, what's going to benefit you. And that's something you can picture for it just in the natural. Uh, so we see in the natural, when we think of a soldier, we think of them on a battlefield, right? And the, the supernatural for believers, the battlefield takes place in our mind. Uh, let me see. Satan will fire assaults of doubt and try to make you believe in the lies. And I believe that most of the change that Keep people in bondage come from those lies. Uh, just remember, and we've always said this, and I know you'll probably heard it, the devil never shows you the full picture. He never shows you the consequences of what he presents to you. And uh, I had a little, I've done this with you before, but then I was doing it, I thought about it during this, this uh, praise and worship, it's like the Holy Spirit reminded me about this illustration. You know, he's not going to come and say, hey, here's a whole chain. Here's this whole bondage that's going to keep you. It's going to cause this. It's going to cause that. It's going to put this addiction in your life. It's going to bring you depression. It's going to bring you these thoughts. No, he's going to bring you one choice. If you take that one choice, it's like a little, uh, it's like a link. Not a whole chain, right? It's a link. When you start making those more choices and more choices, those links start to link up. And then you become in bondage. Those links, they pile up, they chain you. That's something you can pick in the natural. Because that's, it starts with one choice. One choice. And having been grown up in church, I was presented with those choices. And yes, I took the wrong choices. You know, but thank God for redemption. Thank God that I still had time. And I believe one of the biggest lies that the young adults and the youth are facing right now is, especially the ones that are in church, is that you have more time. That you can live and do what you want and come back because you'll have more time. But like Sebastian said, what if that first time is your last time? And I think it's scarier, I was thinking about it, it's different for an unbeliever to die in their sin. But somebody who's been brought up in church, somebody who's been raised in church, somebody who's already been born again, I think it's scary to know God's word and his salvation and then you reject it. It's not something that he takes away. It's something you reject. And you reject the benefits of your salvation. You reject the, the safety that he has given you. When you put on the helmet of salvation, you're putting on Christ himself. Because like all the lies are going to come to you, all the, the lies of doubt, the lies of the enemy, the lies that are going to tear you down, you know God's word. 
that will protect you from it. And uh, we always joke around, Pastor Ella, because she's from the Valley. And we always tell her that uh, she was, she grew up in church and she stayed in church. Because we've been in the Valley and it's, it's really small. And she's like, there's nothing to do but go to church. <laughs> go here in Fort Worth, there's a lot to do. And I grew up, like I tell the youth, I'm always wrote to you. I grew, my youth leaders are here, so. My youth leaders are now my in-laws. So, a lot of the bad stuff that I did while I was growing up in church and did youth were with my youth friends. Because if you can get one to do it, and the others will follow, Satan will start taking out that youth group. And when he takes out the youth group, he takes out those witnesses to the generation that's there. And no, and when you start to lose the youth group, you start to lose the future of the church. And when the church is gone, what are we going to have for the believers? Because the church is for the for the unbelievers. We're here to get fed, and we're here to to get filled so we can take it out. You know, and that's one thing we wanted to do with our youth group was name them commission because, like I told the, the beginning of the year, that's our mandate. We're going to be commissioned. We're going to go out, we're going to win the lost, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. And so, like I said, I started believing the lie, and I started, you know, doing what I wanted to do with my church friends. But, you know, I thank God that for my mother and my grandmother, I know what said, because their prayers are what kept me. Never, ever, and my youth leaders. Your youth leaders would never give up on you. When you think that they, that you're going through hell and back, your youth leaders will never, right. never give up on you. Right. And like I told my youth, if you don't tell me what's going on, the Holy Spirit will tell me. <laughs> the Holy Spirit will tell me, and they can confirm that that's happened before. Yeah. The Lord will give me a dream, I'm like, hey, what's up? She so don't tell me now, but you know, I'm gonna find out whether you like it or not. <laughs> and you know, the Holy Spirit will speak to you like that. Yeah. And he'll speak to your parents, your grandparents. You know, uh, I went through something, and uh, my grandma was used to like this. Heard the Holy Spirit like this, <laughs> and I went through something, and I had told nobody. Okay, I got a tattoo. <laughs> I didn't know anybody. And then my graduation party, my grandma goes, who paid for your tattoo? I was like, what? She goes, who paid for your tattoo? I was like, what tattoo? And she goes, I love him. Nothing. So you think you can hide, you think you can do what you want, but you can't. Holy Spirit will tell me. Yeah. But you know what? That's the benefit that we have. And we shouldn't take that for granted. Because when the Holy Spirit tells on us, that's where it takes us to, like, you know what? That's our wake up call. Mm -hmm. That's for us, like, okay, we need to get right. Because, like I said, you reject the benefits. You reject God. It's a gift. It's not a gift that He's going to take it back. You know, when somebody gives something, they're not going to take it back, right? You, you, need, you reject your gift. Like, oh, I don't want it. I'm not going to do this. So, my phone, if I reject it, I reject everything that I'm able to do with it. I'm able to, you know, to do my emails and able to do this. Stuff that I would have to go out and do, I'm able to do it from my phone. I'm able to reap the benefits, like your salvation. Things you have to go through yourself, you were able to do it with God. Uh, like I said, Satan never tells you the full picture. He's not going to tell you, you know, here's a chain. So, uh, in the army, the helmet serves as protection for the head. It's a vital piece of armor because an attack to the head can result in instant death. When we put on the helmet of salvation, we can understand what is good and what is true. When we forget to put it on, we become vulnerable to the thoughts that are, plan that are planted in us by the enemy who seeks to destroy our walk with Christ and ultimately our lives. When we put on the helmet of salvation, we are putting on Christ himself and he protects us from the spiritual death. Because, you know, we always said, I told you a second ago, that battle takes place in here. And when you lose the battle in your, your mind, yep. you lose it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter, you know, sickness and disease can take out your body and that, whatever. You lose the battle in your mind, you're losing it all. Yeah. Uh, so the natural, when a soldier's head is protected, they feel a sense of safety when they are in the battlefield. 
And for us to wear the helmet of salvation means to live every day focused on eternity and the promised future that we have. It changes the way you live. So your salvation should change the way you live. Those who are in youth, those who are young adults, your salvation, it should change the way you live. It shouldn't be a, a convenience for you on Wednesdays and Sundays. You remember your salvation when you're out there with your friends, when you're out there uh, wherever you are making those decisions. Your salvation should remind you, I'm not going to fall prey to these attacks. I'm not going to give in to these thoughts. So when the enemy's lying to you and saying, you know, smoke this, drink that, do this, do that, you'll be able to be like, no, I'm good. And like we had a discussion with our youth. We were talking about drinking and all that. And so I was like, well, what about social drink? I can honestly tell you, when I, there's no social drinker. Come on. There's no social drinker. There's absolutely no social drinker. Because one drink can lead to an addiction. I come from, my, I come from my father and uh, his father and who lives for them. It's a generational curse of alcoholism. That's right. And when he can take out, especially the men of the family, there goes another generation. Yeah. But even the women, there is no, no social drinker. Because when you start to drink, those little drinks are just like a link. Yeah, they become to get you in bondage. Yeah. And not only are you destroying your spiritual life, you're destroying your your uh, your body. Cirrhosis. I've had uh, my grandfather died of cirrhosis. My dad, he stopped drinking. But I'm still praying for him because he still battles with an addiction. It's an addictive spirit. It's not necessarily the drink. The drink is what will kill you, but the spirit is what's bad and it's already in me. And I've told him before, I'm going to tell you all too, because like I said, we, we don't battle flesh and blood. We don't battle things you see. We battle the spirits and the uh, principalities. And it's an addiction because all my dad has done is replace alcohol with red bulls. And this is that. <laughs> I told my dad, so you get delivered from the addictive spirit. And then, you know, but the <laughs> one Okay. Yeah, we keep, like I said, uh, it changed the way we live, and we can't call ourselves Christians and live however we want. Mm -hmm. And in order to keep the helmet secured, we must fully submit to his ways. You can't just do and pick and choose what you want, okay. you can't do what will benefit you in that moment. There's going to be a hard time, like Sebastian said, you've had to cut off your friends, you've had to cut off this. My two best friends, two best friends that were in my youth group, I don't talk to one, I see one of them maybe once a year. Because you know what? I'm not going to care. I love them, I pray for them, but I'm not going to care for who's, gonna, who's not benefiting my walk with Christ. If they're not benefiting me, my walk with Christ, then I don't need them. And that goes to anybody. I mean, love them from a distance. But if they're honestly not benefiting you with your walk with Christ, what do you need them for? Come on. Pray for them. Right. You don't, they're not. If they're going to make you present you, the enemy will use your friends and kind of present you with choices. My, the enemy will use my cousins. Hey, I started doing bad stuff too at a very young age. Very young age. Because, you know, you feel like you're with people you can trust because they're people that you love. <coughs> But don't let that blind you and fool you from the attacks of the enemy. Just be, even, like I said, the ones that you're in church with. Just because they're in church doesn't mean they're safe. And that's with anybody. The helmet of salvation is a reminder of our identity as a redeemed child of God. Embrace this identity and let it shape how you feel, how you see yourself, and how you get through life's challenges. And I think that's one of the things we had mentioned, uh, Pastor Ella had talked about yesterday. It was just us. We lose our sense of identity. We don't know who we are. And when you know you're redeemed, you know that you're blood bought and you're saved, that's all you need. Because in the end, if you look at it, the simple thing is who's going to fight your battles? If you're redeemed and you're blood bought, the Lord will fight your battles. There's no need for us to do anything. We pray, we seek the Lord. There's no need to fight our battle ourselves because it's already won. Even if you think you lose, it can benefit you because God already has planned out for you. Your victory is already there. Right. Uh, and, 
in the conclusion, the helmet of salvation represented the assurance of guarding the mind, victory, confidence, and the authority God has given you, and the hope provided by salvation. Wow. It serves as an instrument in breaking the chains of bondage. It equips the believer to stand firm against the attacks of the enemy. And we walk in the freedom that Christ has provided. And those who have been through salvation, that we're all saved. Uh, look at the salvation, you know, like the definition. Salvation is to be delivered from our sins and the harmful consequences that come along with them. Jesus paid the ultimate price by being crucified on the cross so that we might have eternal life if we believe in him. We receive salvation by confessing our sins and believing in God's word. We can't find peace when we acknowledge the sacrifice. Uh, we can find peace when we acknowledge the sacrifice Christ made for us. While the world is corrupt and filled with sin, our salvation acts like a helmet and a way to protect our minds. Like I said, you know, your mind is where the battle takes place. I can be going through a sickness. You can be going through a sickness. Who cares? That's something the enemy is going to use in a way. Well, if you're saved, why is God allowing this? Are you going to let that thought fester in your mind? Are you going to let that thought go further? No. You're a redeemed child of God. You know. Lord, my life's in your hands. My sickness is in your hands. You heal me one way or another. Even if it's like a cold. But... I want to touch on too, like Sebastian said, there's nothing in this world. Nothing. My life didn't go, I made mistakes, but you know, I'm glad with who I married because her parents were my youth leaders. But even though I had fallen short, I, I believe that in that mistake that I had, God had a plan. Because if I was not married at such a young, young age, who knows where I'd be? Who knows where I would have been? This one kept me in church. Yeah. Come on. Kept me in church. Right. Kept me know. She, she helped me. <laughs> when you know we finally got right in everything, she told me, We're gonna be married, I'm gonna serve in ministry, you're gonna serve with her with, I'm gonna serve with or without you see very young train. It was one of those uh, I gave the choice, but I already gave the answer. <laughs> you're going to serve with me or you better find a spot and I've seen that since our life has gotten right I've seen the benefits of it I have four beautiful daughters who are growing up in church my daughters want to come to church my daughters have um, they're sensitive to the spirit they've seen the way you know their parents are and They've seen the benefits of our salvation. Because you don't have kids yet, but you have to, for the future generation, you have to, you're going to have to think about it. Live right for your children. Because we talked about this before, you know, when those who are young adults, when you have children, you're going to be one of the biggest influences in your children's lives. And you don't want to be living in the world and coming to church on Sunday when you're teaching your kids. So, um, there's nothing in this world that was going to satisfy you. I mean, believe me. I've been bound by the chains of darkness, depression. I've had suicidal thoughts. I've, I've done it all. That's even in my 20s and my... No, I'm 30s. I was fully delivered by then. <laughs> Amen. You know, I've been, you can come to church, but you can be still bound by certain chains. Yeah, you can be sent bound by your your depression and anxiety and thoughts of suicide and all this. But you know what? God is able to deliver and set you free. Amen. 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 I've been a social drinker, even serving in ministry. You know, <laughs> <My mother. laughs> but you know what? That social drinker is what you know caused me a lot of strife, caused me to go broke, caused me to this. That social drinking becomes a chain, and 
I can honestly say, I, we go into a restaurant and that's the first thing I order is a drink. There's no waiting at the, at the table, I'll wait at the bar. But I can say that I can go to a party, not a party party, I can go to where there's alcohol and I cannot be tempted. Amen. Amen. I cannot be tempted. Because when I try to quit by myself, and you think you can do it on your own, you can't. Until I fully submitted my life to Christ and said, Lord, I want you to take this chain, I want you to take this bondage. I tried the pastors, I tried everything. I smoked with the pastors on. Until I fully realized that I could not do it without God's help to break these chains is when I fully was able to give it up. Told her, no desire. And that's what your salvation should do is, it can be a process. But it's possible. Okay. And when you have people who are benefiting you, or people who you're in the youth group who should be benefiting you, who should be encouraging you, it makes it a whole lot easier. So, uh, I'll finish with uh, just what I have to ask. So stand firm in which God has given you, and you will see his victory manifested in your own life. He has already given you everything you need to do, so each and every day through putting on the armor of God. And just like you wouldn't get partially dressed when you wake up in the morning before you head out the door, God doesn't want you to get partially dressed either when it comes to war. Amen. And it's a war. So that's all I have. I hope you received something. Uh, if I sound a little lost, I'm used to youth groups, I'm used to interaction. So you're just staring at me. <laughs> if you heard me taking pot I was waiting for, you know, Gabriel to say something. <laughs> I was waiting, you know, when you're in the group, I'm sure you understand your youth interaction. Right. So, we want to invite you tonight. I believe it's going to be a powerful, powerful yes. night. Yes. Yes. Yes.